Okay, so welcome everybody to our penultimate lecture on privacy protection in federated learning. Uh, before I start talking about privacy protection, just uh, a few comments or answers to student questions I have received. So one question was, uh, how can we extend the, the limited methods for federated learning? Uh, like in the first assignment, we had a very simple model where we uh, we used a linear model using a single constant feature. So the, the quantity of interest, the label of a data point, the temperature reading uh, was basically a constant plus some noise. And then there was a question of a student, how can this ever be useful? So this is the, the temperature, let's say 20 degrees, and you want to predict the temperature just by using one single constant value. So this is the this is the model parameter. But here I want to point out that you can, not, nobody prevents you from using uh, a single data point for a local data set. So you can have one local data set for each temperature measurement. And this means you have here all of a sudden uh, another model parameter that you can tune. So you can make this arbitrary uh, nonlinear, so to say, because you have a separate model parameter for each local data set uh, by, by using uh, local data sets as uh, by defining local data sets as single temperature measurement. So that's the extreme case. And sometimes it might be actually useful or, or the only possibility that you have only one data point for a local data set uh, and not more. But still you can learn something together by using this similarity graph. So by using the similarity graph, which penalizes the difference between the model parameters or the squared absolute or the square of the difference. So you can make uh, this simple local model, which is just a constant, so a, a linear model uh, with only a bias term, no, no features at all. Uh, but you can make it more powerful by saying, I use this empirical graph the nodes of the empirical graph are the individual weather measurements. So you can then learn up almost arbitrary uh, mappings from local data set to uh, predict the temperature. Yeah, so that was the first comment. So you don't need to, to come up with deep neural networks uh, for these local models to make any to make something more useful or more interesting compared to the simple constant uh, constant model parameter because you can uh, make the, the local data sets smaller. Any questions at this point? And this is actually a fine, uh, would be a, a nice model for your federated learning projects. So how many of you think about doing this project, federated learning project? So some, yeah, less than half. Okay, and then for those, it might be also useful to know or to know a trick how to extend a a linear model. So in this course, I only, or in the lecture notes, I only cover local linear models. So we want to learn a, a hypothesis that reads in the features of a data point. So X is the feature vector and outputs a prediction, which is a linear combination of, of its features or this inner product in, in the vector notation. And then you might say, well, this is too, too limited. I might have a, a highly nonlinear relation. So let's say we have, uh, data points characterized by a single feature and label value, and, and you have data points looking something like this. So there's no way that you find one straight line, one linear model that fits the, the this data points arbitrarily well. But what can you do? How can you upgrade a linear model? Which design freedom can you use? Kernels, yeah, so this is related to what I have in mind you can use different features. So instead of using this original feature, you could say you, you quantize these features and this you will, will actually do in, uh, in the next coding assignment for model poisoning. There we have, we will use this uh, upgrading a linear model because only then we can make more interesting uh, back, backdoor attacks 
But so you could define then for each of these intervals, you could define a new feature, x1, for example, which is one for all data points that fall into this interval, whose feature falls into this interval, and zero otherwise. So this is kind of a one-hot encoding for the, for the indicator function of this interval. And so for the number, for each of these intervals, you get a new feature, three, four, five, six, seven. So we would have seven new features. And uh, you could then stack these new features into a new feature vector, let's call it X prime. So these are then the, the indicators of the intervals. And then a linear function, a linear model in these new features would look like this, would look piecewise constant. And I guess you get the idea, the smaller you make these intervals, of course, you would, you would need then more intervals to cover the whole value range, the interesting value, value range. The finer you can approximate any linear function, uh, non-linear function, uh, uh, if it's somewhat smooth or, or uh, continuous, Lipschitz continuous. Okay, so you can upgrade a linear model easily by using new features. Do you know an, another uh, way to generate new features? that make a, a linear model more powerful? A more data-driven method to learn new features? Well, if you look at uh, a deep neural network, so you have uh, some layers of neurons. We don't care now about the details. The important thing is in many uh, deep neural network architectures, you have a final layer being a, a linear model. So in the end, you just add up and get the output of this uh, deep neural network. And you can write this whole uh, deep neural network as actually a linear model. So this is a linear model, but not in the original features, but in new features. And these features is exactly what you see in the pen, uh, the output of the penultimate layer or of the, uh, I think you can call it the last layer. So here the output of this layer are new features. So what a, a deep neural network does is actually it jointly trains a linear model and it trains a feature map uh, that produces the new features that are fed into this linear model. Yes. Very good point. So if, if these uh, neurons, they would be linear, they would like add up, weight, weight, the inputs and add up, then uh, you would end up again with a linear map. So you, you need to have nonlinear activation functions. Yeah. Yeah, but it, it's a linear function. You can write this whole function as a linear function in the new features. Of course, these new features are a highly nonlinear function of the original features. But uh, there are applications where you don't care so much about this learning this function because this might be from a pre trained model or sometimes called foundational models. So this might be a pre trained model. So when you use a pre trained deep neural network, this basically is a feature that uh, gives you features that you feed in into a linear model. Okay, any other questions at this point? Yes. Uh, if we're dealing with very high dimensional data, wouldn't, it, wouldn't it, it also be possible to transfer the high dimensional data to a lower dimension with PCA, for example, and use yes. it to get features like with the neural network? Right? Yes, yes. But PCA, so PCA would be another way to get new features, but it's a, a linear method. So it, it only works well if the overall relation between features and output is, is linear. Uh, and if, if this relation is nonlinear, like for example, the pixels of an image and the fact if it shows a cat or not, this is a highly nonlinear map. So there you will not, uh, maybe not get uh, far with, with using PCA, but in general, you can also use PCA to obtain new features. It's also a feature learning method and a very useful one in, in many applications. Okay. So nobody hinders you from using a pre-trained transformer network that is used in, in GPT, uh, large language models, uh, to generate new features that you then feed into this boring local linear model that we use in this course. Okay, just these two 
uh, comments on questions I received from the students so far. But now uh, let's continue with the topic of today's lecture, which is privacy protection. So privacy is uh, uh, kind of a widely used term, but uh, to, to deal with it in our course, we need to make it uh, mathematically precise. So would any one of you know how to define privacy or to define when is privacy violated? or when is a, a privacy leakage uh, present in a federated learning algorithm? How would you define privacy? I mean, uh, every one of us has uh, um, uh, a natural or an intuitive idea of what is privacy. For example, I, I use a fitness tracker app, which tracks my heart rate. And then I could say my heart rate, uh, is a private property of me because I don't want, for example, a potential employer see my heart rates and then give me only a two-year contract instead of a, a permanent position. So it's a private property. Or if I have a certain disease, if I have COVID or not. So some, some attributes of a data point, data point being me, a person in this case, that we do not want to share. So uh, it's similar to a feature. It's a, a property or an attribute of a data point, uh, but I call it S, S for sensitive or private. So we have a certain data point, this could be me, and the, the private property is heart rate. Heart rate during a certain exercise. And then what could happen? So how could you find out my heart rate? How could you find out if I have a high heart rate or a low, or low heart rate or an okayish heart rate during my last activity? Yes. How how would you get the data from my smartwatch? So database, like yes. So if you would work at don't know, let's call it Polar, the company you work there and you have access to all the data sets there which my phone automatically, of course, if I if I approved it at some point, uploads my training data. So Polar knows most likely my heart rate statistics. Okay, but you, how could you as another user get, get an idea of my heart rate? And here comes the, feder the privacy leakage into play or potential privacy leakage. So let's assume uh, you pull data from this uh, smart, uh, this, fitness tracker company, they pull the data all together and train a model, train a model that you also use. You can use this model to predict for you the best uh, exercise tomorrow to get best training effect. So you, you get a model parameters, learned model parameters. And the question is from this trained model, can you reobtain or can you invert this map so this, this is uh, where we use federated learning. So federated learning algorithm, mathematically, or in a very simple mathematical model, is just a map. I call it a map, calligraphic A for algorithm, that reads in the local data sets and outputs model parameters. And these model parameters might be shared with everyone because this, uh, this fitness tracker app company wants to serve all of you predictions, intelligent, uh, activity or, or fitness plans. So this is shared. This is shared to all users. And one user could maybe try to, to use this knowledge to infer what was my heart rate. And yeah, one, one important aspect here, very important aspect, we will now talk about methods to, to make this algorithm like uh, privacy protecting, privacy protecting. But that's always, or one, one, one technical term is uh, differential privacy. We, we will use differential privacy to measure how much information is leaked by sharing this output of the algorithm, the trained model parameters. How much information does this contain about my heart rate, the sensitive property? And you can, yes. Right, but if 
find out anything about you. Yeah. Um, does your financial privacy in any way impacted? If I, for example, know your height and your weight, yeah. and I give a, and I use that data in order to imitate that with you, mm -hmm. would that still impact the output? Like, would I then get a heart rate that is close to? Good point. So the, the comment hinted already at what, what I was aiming at. You never know uh, the side information. The side information, like you have access to the database of this smart of this fitness tracker app. Somehow you get access because you are an employee and have clearance level, the highest clearance level. So you can really log in and enter this. So all the effort we put put into this making this federated learning algorithm privacy protecting is useless once you have this side information. So the important thing is, whenever you hear guarantees about privacy protection of an algorithm, then this is only a, a relative statement. This means this algorithm doesn't uh, give you more information, to, doesn't give you a certain level, uh, doesn't give you more than a certain level of information about a property. But it cannot, you can never guarantee as an algorithm developer, uh, if this um, uh, attacker, let's call it attacker, who wants to find out my heart rate has some side information. For example, he or she is my, my spouse or family member and just knows because I told the person before. So it doesn't matter if we uh, if we give this person a privacy protecting federated learning algorithm because this person for some reason has a side channel. So you can never, so you should never be, be feel too safe even if you can prove that this algorithm and there are ways, mathematical ways to test the privacy protection and test the, uh, uh, or bound the level of privacy leakage, but it's only a relative statement. It doesn't exclude the case that you have side information. And this was also the case, or this was uh, uh, partially uh, the, the reason for this privacy leakage cases discussed in the previous guest lecture by Professor Vasio from Torino, because so the, the case there was you had a database, what was it, hospital visits? which were itself kind of released and privacy, uh, privacy preserving. So these hospital records didn't have identifiers, social security numbers or something. But there was some other database that contained partially uh, private information, like it was voter or election regist registers of, of voters. And then combining these data sources, so including the side channel in this case, or the side information allows to infer uh, private properties, like if a certain person was at the hospital, uh, visited the hospital. So this is very important. We, we now talk about privacy protection in federated learning. So you will hear about methods to protect the privacy, but this is only a relative statement. You can never exclude uh, the presence of a side, side information or side channel that kind of breaks this uh, protection anyway. Any questions at this point? Oh, yeah, I forgot. Yeah, we got a comment. Good question. So there's a candy. <laughs> Anybody else? Did I forget somebody? You, yes. Ah, that was a, what's my mistake? Sorry. Lame throw. Okay. So just after I had this, uh, Disclosure, these words of warning. So don't don't be overly optimistic if uh, federated learning scientists proudly brag about uh, a new method that is guaranteeing differential privacy. Uh, it might not help you anyway when you get uh, when you have a side channel. But now we focus on what we can do. So what we can do is we can make this map. We can make this mapping uh, non-invertible. So mathematically, the idea of privacy protection is ensure that this map does not allow to recover the input data just from the uh, from the output, the delivered output, the, the trained model. So we want uh, this mapping A, which reads in the data set. So I use the data set as a, a shorthand for, for the collection of all local data sets. So it doesn't really matter if we do federated learning or machine learning. The, the concepts are, so uh, on a high level, I discuss them on, on, a, on a high level. So they apply directly to machine learning and federated learning. You just have a different 
organization of the data sets here into, into this local data sets. So how can we how can we measure the invertibility of this map that reads in a data set and outputs a vector? So this vector might be the yeah, that's visible, the trained model parameters at each node in our empirical graph. So this is the output. This is the input of the map of the algorithm. This is the output. So this is just an abstract model or abstract representation of, for example, algorithm 5.1 in the lecture notes, which uses gradient descent to solve uh, GTV minimization. Mathematically, if you abstract all the details, and this is, of course, a, 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 a crude approximation or a crude uh, or an idealization, in practice, you have to implement this algorithm on real hardware. But in the end, what you do is you implement a map that reads in the data and outputs something. And the something is the trained model parameters. So the question is, is this map invertible? Uh, and one way to measure this uh, non-invertibility is called differential privacy. So in differential privacy, we assume that this map is a random variable. So for each input, the output is the realization of a random variable. Why not? It includes a, a deterministic map, which would be a random variable that takes on one value with probability one. So it's just a bit, um, it, it gives us a bit more flexibility and it may turn out to be convenient. And also in practice, uh, it might be a useful modeling assumption. Why, why can, or for which algorithms is the output this reasonably described by a random variable or a probability distribution? What algorithms did we talk about in this course where there's some, some randomness coming into play? Or stoch stochasticity? Gradient descent? Yeah, which form of gradient descent? Yeah, gradient descent, but uh, a variant of gradient descent. Okay. Yes. Very good. Very good. Please. Oh. <laughs> You're welcome. So stochastic gradient descent naturally uh, is described by a probability distribution because you use some randomness. You use a random selection of, of data points. And in general, the data that you feed into an algorithm is often uh, interpreted as realizations of random variables. This is something very natural in machine learning. Uh, because it allows us to analyze algorithms. For example, algorithms for differential privacy. So if we look at the fixed data set, then the output of this algorithm is characterized by a probability distribution. So with some probability, we get uh, model parameters being 10. Let's say we have a single model parameter. With some other probability, we get uh, the learned model parameters in an interval around three. Okay, and now uh, if we want this algorithm to be not invertible, then what we would like is if we use another data set, we call it D prime and apply the algorithm, which gives us another distribution, that this distribution should be different. Okay, so we have a probability distribution over the learned parameter vectors for so this is a, a parameter for parameter uh, for data set D, and we have another distribution for learn parameters for data set D prime. And so what we're interested in is uh, in non-invertibility in a very specific sense. Just just requiring this mapping to be non-invertible is too easy. It's too easy to satisfy because these are so high dimensional objects then you could just build in a small region where, where a different data set results in a different weight vector, but this region of, of, of data sets is, is not really relevant or important. So just requiring 
uh, non-invertibility is too easy to satisfy. This really doesn't give us much privacy protection. So we must be very specific how we want this to be non-invertible. And this being specific is via the notion of neighboring data sets. So a neighbor, neighboring data set, D prime, is obtained from a, a given data set by changing a single single data point or the, the private attribute of a single data point. So changing the private attribute of a single data point. So very uh, in, in our example, this E prime might be obtained from manipulating the original trading set that this fitness tracker app collects from its users by changing my heart, uh, heart rate, by changing my heart rate from high to low or from low to high. So by changing one single private attribute, and this is what we want to protect. So when you, when you look at then the distribution for this different data set where we just change this private attribute of me, then the output should look very different. That's the rough idea. I know. Should be should be close close to each other. If it look, would look very different, then we could use then we could use the output to detect if there was a change in this private feature. Sorry. So if if we 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 look at this uh, uh, neighboring data sets, we want them actually to be very similar or overlapping. So in this case, this this look does look like a good privacy protecting example because you would have. If you change the, the private attribute of me, the heart rate, the output look, would look very different. And you could detect this. So you could say, aha, this is the output distribution. Somehow you, you can measure or estimate the output distribution. So heart rate is high. Whereas if you know that it's this distribution, heart rate is low. So the basic idea that of differential privacy is, or measuring differential privacy means to measure the similarity between these two probability distributions. So we want these two to be very similar. This should be similar, similar to the probability distribution for the original data set. So how can we measure the similarity between probability distributions? KL divergence, yes. Measure similarity between uh, the output, the distribution of the output for the perturbed data set and the distribution of the output for the original data set. So one, one way is to use the KL divergence. One measure of KL divergence. That's one good approach that's also used. Uh, in particular, a variant of the KL divergence or a generalization called Reigny divergence. Did you hear about Reigny divergence? So this is called, just to write it out, and it has a parameter alpha, Reigny. I think it's named after a researcher called Alfred Reigny. You find more details about this definition of this divergence in the lecture notes, but we will also not use it in much in great detail in this course. So we will not use uh, properties of this Rini divergence. I just want to mention it, that this is used here as a measure of similarity. And it's, uh, it's useful for the analysis of certain algorithms. In particular, there is a recent work that uses Rini divergence to study the privacy protection of stochastic gradient descent, which is exactly the type of algorithm we use in this course for federated learning algorithms. So this turns out to be very useful from a, a mathematical analysis point of view. So you, you can get a lot of insights when, you, when measuring privacy protection using any divergence. Okay, but uh, yeah, any questions at this point? Yes? So uh, like, uh, we are doing this because we don't want someone to get your data, like your heart. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, if you want to know, like, uh, suppose you were, your data is in the test case, uh, and you want to know like what will be the best exercise for you. Mm -hmm. So in that time, what will happen? Like it will show you the correct data or like the incorrect. 
Sorry, again, but when I want to use the prediction. Yes, uh, when you want to use the prediction, actually, like my question is like, uh, we are doing this because like, uh, suppose I'm, uh, like, suppose that if I will get your data, like your yep. heart rate, if I want to make uh, like the best exercise for tomorrow, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So like, what will happen? Like, if you want to know your uh, what will be the best exercise of you for tomorrow, so what will happen then? Well, we try. So we try to to design this algorithm such that you get useful parameter vectors for predicting the best exercise tomorrow while at the same time not allowing me to recover or to distinguish between these two neighboring data sets. But there's typically a, a trade-off. So uh, the, uh, the general idea of ensuring privacy is, is to add noise somewhere. So either to add noise directly to the data or to add noise or perturb the output. And this perturbation will also harm, harm the ability of W head of these model parameters to predict the, or to solve the uh, original learning task, like predicting the best activity. But at the same time, the more you perturb this, the more these distributions will look similar and the more you will protect, uh, my, my heart rate will be protected. Yeah, but th that's a good point. So there's a trade-off between privacy protection, privacy protection and uh, call it utility, utility of the, of the learned parameter vectors. So the utility in this learned parameter vectors is how well do they predict the quantity of interest, which could be the, the best activity for me tomorrow? Okay. What else? Yes. Yes. So I, I think I understood like when uh, we are creating this neighboring data set, like if these if the distributions are of the parameter. Yeah. Different. Yeah. And then, um, then we kind of know like what is affecting the change, like the exact um, feature uh, and data points. So you. Mm -hmm. Um. What is like in? How does this look in practice? Like, like how does somebody do this, or like what kind of hack would somebody actually do to create this D prime? Good question. So what, what you could do is you could somehow you get, so, so, so what does it mean? What, what does it mean uh, when, when we use these measures? So when, when we know this measure here is small, uh, what does it mean in practice? What you could do is you get somehow uh, access to this algorithm, like the source code, the Python source code of this algorithm. Uh, modern uh, or uh, there might be even required by law that this fitness tracker app or company must share the algorithm, the learning algorithm. And what, once you get this algorithm, you can set up synthetic data sets uh, and you manipulate some of these data sets by, by using different values for the heart rate of me or by, by some data point that has similar properties as me. So my home postal code, my height, my weight. And then you try to learn a, a predictor from the output of this algorithm to this private feature. So you, 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 you formulate this as a machine learning problem. A, a high level or uh, meta learning problem where the input uh, uh, or the, the quantity of interest is the, the private feature of one data point and the features that you feed into this model is the output of this algorithm, is the, the weight vectors. So I, I, I sketched these ideas also in the lecture notes. But yeah, it, it's a very good question. What, what does it mean? I mean, it's nice mathematics. You can write down, somehow you get an estimate or somehow you, 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 you model these probability distributions you evaluate the KL divergence. It's all nice and gives nice papers, but what, what does it mean in practice? And what it means is if this is small, then you have a, uh, you will get a lower bound. You can prove a lower bound on the classification accuracy uh, for the method that I sketched. So you get a lower bound. Really, how well can you train or learn a hypothesis that reads in the algorithm output and tries to predict my heart rate? You can come up with lower bounds then for this. So this is also nice about this privacy uh, leakage measures. They have an operational meaning. Let's call it operational meaning. Yes. Yes, so, so the size of this data set will typically impact the, the, the bounds on the similarity measures. 
And the larger you make the data set, the smaller you get this bounds on the similarity or the more similar these this distributions would get and the uh, stronger guarantees or the, the higher uh, classification error you will ensure. So yeah, there's a trade-off between the amount of data uh, that you use, uh, that you feed into the federated learning algorithm and the level of privacy protection in general. Yes. Okay, any other questions at this point? You get it. <laughs> Very good. Uh, okay, uh, differential privacy off the shelf. Uh, yeah, who of you has heard about differential privacy before? Not? Okay, so differential privacy seems to be somewhat like the industry standard or the federated learning industry standard. It also found its way into legal or regularization documents or standardization. So when you look up an ISO standard, or I don't know, another standardization organization, they might use the term differential privacy. So I give you a bit more details about differential privacy now. Uh, it uses a different measure for similarity. It doesn't use the, directly the Renier divergence or KL divergence. It uses a different approach. So it, it uh, looks at any possible uh, set or measurable set, let's call it T, and this set T might be uh, the define a test, might define a test that I have sketched before. So whenever the, the trained model parameter W hat falls into this interval or, or set T, we predict data set must be D. Whenever it does not fall into T, we say, okay, the data set uh, is more likely D prime. So we can define a, a test, or we can use this, or we can think of this interval as defining a test or a classifier that tries to classify the which data set we have used, and by by detecting which data set, it somehow uh, reveals the private information because the difference between D and D prime is my heart rate. So, and differential privacy now, uh, or differential privacy measures how different this probability distribution looks like over this interval. So the probability of, uh, of the output falling into this region, given or under the assumption that the data set is D, should be the same as the probability that the output of the algorithm falls into T under the perturbed or neighboring data set. So differential privacy quantifies the difference between these two probabilities for any for any set T. Uh, who of you took a course on probability theory? Okay. Do you know if this makes sense for any set T? Which type of sets should we look at? Sorry? Measurable. Measurable for any measurable set. Yeah, because uh, I mean, this is like a, a little detail, but an important detail because only for measurable sets, this expression makes sense. You can evaluate this probability. Very good. So now I have to. You want the chocolate? Yes. Where is it? Ah, sorry. I must practice more. Okay. For any measurable set, this should be approximately the same, but uh, this approximation sign is not too, too fancy. So we make it a bit more precise. And we say uh, this algorithm that generates, so the algorithm, where does the algorithm show up here? The algorithm determines this probability distributions. That's where the algorithm comes into play. So it's a bit indirect, uh, but nevertheless, an algorithm is epsilon delta differential private, if this uh, inequality holds uh, e to the epsilon plus delta for all measurable sets. So I know, am I out, you know, it's very tight. Did I forget the sign here? No, wow, oh. okay. So here's the definition. 
of epsilon delta differential privacy. And uh, yeah, the smaller epsilon, epsilon very small and delta very small means we require these two probabilities to be almost the same for any measurable set. And if they're almost the same, so the probabilities are the same, the probability distributions look the same, this tells us or this uh, guarantees that we cannot come up with any good detector or classifier that looks at the output and finds a certain region of the output and then tells us either heart rate was high or heart rate was low. So if, if we can prove this inequality for all measurable sets with very small epsilon and very small delta, then the operational meaning of this is that we cannot find, there is no uh, machine learning algorithm or classification algorithm that only reads in W hat and tells us with high accuracy if my heart rate was high or low. Okay, so is this, is this an absolute guarantee, by the way? No, why not? Because there might be a side channel. A side channel. So somebody, my my friend works at this fitness tracker company and has highest clearance level and knows exactly my heart rate. Very good. I have still a few. Okay. So that's what I wanted to say about the definition of differential privacy. Any questions at this point? This is really... This seems to be now the key or the most widely used notion of uh, privacy leakage measure. How do, it's like using using meter to measure distances, using kilograms to measure uh, mass. We use differential privacy to measure privacy leakage or most people in the federated learning industry. This seems to be now at the moment a standard. I'm not uh, too big a fan of it, but it seems to be widely agreed to be useful. Yes, why not? I, I like uh, more uh, information. So why, why I'm not too big a fan of, of differential privacy? Uh, because I, I, don't see, I don't see the big advantage of, of using this definition of similarity between probability distributions. Uh, it has maybe an advantage that you can you can translate this this quantities epsilon and delta into minimum levels of classification errors for any classifier. So that's okay. But in general, I'm more fan of of information theoretic measures, and that's actually what I wanted to talk about next. You can also measure the leakage by quantifying or measuring the mutual information, mutual information between the private property S of a data point and uh, what you observe W hat. So somewhat, I, I like this measure more because it, it has units. So you can measure it in bits. Uh, but it seems, yeah, differential privacy seems to be the standard at the moment. Okay, uh, what did I want to say now? So now that we know how to measure differential privacy, how can we make sure that an, our algorithm is differential private? How can we ensure differential privacy of an algorithm? And there are two approaches to this, at least two. So one is, well, the question is how to ensure our algorithm is differential private. And the idea is, if, if you do not uh, already design the algorithm to be differential private, for example, using stochastic gradient descent, so if for some constructions of algorithms like stochastic gradient descent, they already come, they already come built in with differential privacy. And you can even characterize the, the level. So 
is epsilon and delta, depending on the on the algorithm parameters. But what what if this algorithm is you cannot prove or somehow you don't know if this is differential private? Well, what you could do is you could either do a pre-processing or a post-processing. And these two approaches are very similar. They just differ at the location where you apply it. So in pre-processing, we apply a, a map to the, to the data set and then feed this uh, pre-processed data into the algorithm. So the algorithm is applied to pre-processed data. And this pre-processing might be to add noise. So to add noise to the features and labels of the data points, the pre-processing could also mean to select a subset of data points, subsampling can guarantee differential privacy. Uh, the alternative is post-processing. So you, you take the algorithm output and apply some output map post-processing. And here we have uh, the option, for example, we could add noise to the output directly. So we 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 uh, get some trained model parameters, trained model parameters of the algorithm w hat, and we add some noise to it. And of course, this so this noise could be taken from different distributions. One one possible choice is a normal distribution with some variance sigma squared. And then of course, the larger you, uh, the the stronger you make the noise, or the higher the noise variance is, that typically the more uh, the smaller this this parameters epsilon and delta becomes, that is the more the, uh, level or the higher level of differential privacy you ensure. But on the other hand, if you add noise with high variance, the usefulness or the utility of these uh, learned parameters will reduce. So there is typically a trade off of the utility utility of the algorithm and the privacy protection. So for high utility, we have small privacy protection, but the more privacy protection we want, the smaller the utility becomes of the, of the output of the noisy model parameters. And we, we can navigate this curve typically by varying sigma squared, the noise variance that we add. Okay. And the utility, by the way, how, how can we measure the utility? Well, the utility of, of this uh, weight vector could be measured by mutual inf information. So the uh, mutual information between the noisy output of the algorithm and the, the label of a data point that we would like to predict. Okay. Any questions at this point? So uh, let me highlight again, you typically will have a trade-off between privacy protection. So the more privacy protection you can guarantee or you ensure with your algorithm or post-processing or pre-processing, the smaller the utility will become. And the utility is, for example, measured by mutual information or uh, accuracy, prediction accuracy on a validation set. Okay, so one important property of differential privacy is uh, called uh, the data processing inequality or, or data, uh, what is it called? Com composition, compositionality. So what do I mean by compositionality or composition properties? Once you, you have uh, a mapping that is differential private, so let's say this, Preprocessing map, polygraphic I, is differential private. Anything you do then afterwards, and that has not direct, that's important, that has not direct access to the data. So anything you do afterwards, but which has not direct access to the data. So any algorithm that you apply to this uh, preprocessed data set can never reduce the level of differential privacy, can never weaken uh, the privacy protection. That's nice. So once you apply, a pre-processing method, like you add noise to the raw data, 
there is no algorithm unless this algorithm has side information. But if you rule out side information, no algorithm can uh, hurt this privacy protection that you have introduced already. And that's the reason why you could also combine. So you can do a pre-processing and a post-processing. It can never hurt, so to say. Okay, that's what I wanted to tell about pre-processing and post-processing for differential privacy. Uh, yeah, one aspect is, of course, then how to choose this noise level, the sigma squared. In general, you will have a trade-off, but uh, can you tell somehow how, how large the sigma square should be for a given for a given algorithm. So you have an algorithm. You do not know if it's differential private, yes or not. You, you want to make it differential private, so you add noise with, with a certain variance. So how large does the variance have to be? And you see here in this picture that when the algorithm changes a lot, so the output looks very different when you flip only one private property of a data point, when this is very different, then you should intuitively add more noise. So blur it out more over, over the whole value range of, of learned parameters. And so how can we measure this uh, sensitivity of the output for, for two different uh, data sets? Well, we just look at the output. So we look at the output of the algorithm for the neighboring data set that has the flipped private attribute and we compute the squared norm of the distance or the difference between the output to the original data set. And then we look at the, the maximum over all these differences in the output for all uh, neighboring data sets. So D, D prime neighbors. So we look over all pairs of neighboring data sets that only differ in one private feature and look how much does the output change. And if this output changes a lot, so this maximum is large, then this means that for certain neighboring data sets, there's a very significant change in the output of the algorithm. So we must blur it more. So this will typically be proportional or for larger sensitivity, this is called sensitivity, Sometimes sensitivity, for larger sensitivity, we should have a larger sigma squared. Yeah. I also refer to recent literature, which derives, uh, which makes this very informal discussion of mine precise. So uh, when you choose sigma squared proportional to this sensitivity, you can really guarantee differential privacy with a, a known level of epsilon and delta. Yeah, and here there was this comment before, how, how does the, the size of the data set influence the differential privacy? And typically it will influence uh, the differential privacy properties via this sensitivity. When you have intuitively, when you have more data points in your training set, then changing a single private feature between two neighboring data sets will, have, will be averaged out over more data points. So this difference will be smaller, roughly. Yes? Very good. So one strategy to, uh, to ensure differential privacy is data augmentation. Use more data points. Oops, sorry. Data augmentation, yeah. But if you do data augmentation, this is a form of regularization, and somehow it might affect the, the statistical performance, the accuracy, predictive accuracy. Yes. So, so, so uh, the conjecture is uh, you you will reduce explainability if you add noise. I'm thinking that 
overall impact should be minimal, usually, right? Should be so. Well, of course, yeah. We want we want to have explainable methods. We want to have algorithms that are differential, private, and explainable. But I don't know. I'm also not aware of recent work that studies trade-offs between those two. I don't know. Are there trade-offs between explainability and privacy protection? Maybe, but I don't know. Yes. Could you also use like instead of a classic like noise like deterministic chaos or something for this the last this if you really like some yeah, uh, so differential privacy, they are by, by nature stochastic guarantees. So you need to somehow smear out the, the distribution over continuous random, uh, over continuous values. So when you use deterministic, uh, <clears throat> deterministic perturbations, you might only uh, achieve here a certain, well, a shift, you can shift those. So maybe, yes, for certain distributions, if the shape is the same and you just shift it, then you can make it more similar. But uh, I'm not sure if, if this is, is uh, widely applicable. So uh, I, I do not know about uh, methods uh, for differential privacy where this noise is deterministic. Yeah, I was thinking if you had like, um... because there's this like inclusion of chaos in mm -hmm. And if you like could use the initial condition as like a key and have that somehow just progress, like a key exchange between mm -hmm. like the two parties to mm -hmm. this that kind of to some extent sort of graphic to get that distribution, like that unmask it, then you wouldn't have any uh loss. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I haven't heard about these methods. Yeah. But yeah, so uh, we do not study uh, uh, cryptographic methods here. So this is a, a learning approach. We want to ensure that from observing the output of the algorithm, there's no way we can construct a, a, an algorithm or a classifier that with high probability tells us if my private feature was high or low. Okay. Uh, any other questions at this point? Then let's uh, wrap it up with the last method I would like to discuss, which is privacy-preserving feature learning or private feature learning. So the idea is And this you will also practice or try out in the coding assignment. <clears throat> the idea is to write from the start, when you, when you look at the data points or when you're reading the data points, so a data point being a person, for example, or a weather measurement, uh, it has features and the label. So why not trying right from the beginning, transform these features so apply a feature transformation. So you get new features that are privacy preserving. Uh, how can we measure privacy preservation or privacy leakage? Well, I mentioned already one uh, approach could be to use the mutual information between C and the private property. So this private property is somewhat, somehow a function of X. Some, uh, this private property somehow depends on X. For example, it could be it could be one of the features, but that's just one example. So it could be the second feature. It could also be some function of a subset of the features, somewhat uh, a map of the features. <clears throat> but this doesn't really matter because we can uh, define this mutual information as long as we somehow characterize the underlying probability distribution. So we want this. So this is a measure, measures, Privacy leakage. And how, how can we make this uh, privacy leakage zero? So this is a, a non-negative number. It can be zero. How can we make this mutual information zero trivially? Which features for sure have no information 
about the private attribute. Yeah. Well, this is just the name of, of the new features. So which feature map five outputs a, a, new, a new feature set or C that carries zero information about S? Well, a constant, for example, phi x is always zero. Then this mutual information is zero, typically. Uh, is this something useful, do you think? New features always zero, maybe not. Because what, what is the ultimate goal of machine learning? To predict the label. So we also need to measure, and this is now a precise measure for the utility. It's the mutual information between the label of a data point and the new features. So this is utility. This uh, mutual information is, is uh, in some senses, a more convenient mathematical tool to measure the utility. But uh, in machine learning terms, if this is large, if this is relatively high, then it's possible to find a map, a hypothesis, or learn a hypothesis that reads in the new features and predicts the label. So this uh, mutual information is just a mathematical nice tool to measure the ability of, of being able to learn a hypothesis that predicts the label from C. We avoid we avoid bringing in the, the, the learning algorithm. So we don't care how we can obtain this H hat. We just know there is some H hat. There is some function that can predict the label well from the new features C. And all we need to know is if this mutual information is sufficiently large. Okay. But again, there, there will be a trade-off. So for high uh, utility, so this, the utility, you might typically get more uh, privacy leakage. And this curve is known as the privacy funnel. And there, uh, there's literature from information theory, so information theoretic approaches, that study this curve and try to find an optimal uh, optimal feature mapping such that the utility uh, the utility is maximized for a given for a given uh, maximum level of, of privacy leakage. So you you require uh, that the leakage is not is never larger than this here. Let's say eta, and then you want to find this point here, so the maximum utility that you can achieve when you need to ensure this level of privacy leakage, or the other way around. So you want to ensure a minimum level of, uh, of utility. What's the, what's the minimum level of privacy leakage you can get by varying this transformation map? Yes? Uh, this I? Yeah. Z. C, C is, the, is uh, defined as the output of this feature map. Feature map, yeah. Yeah, and this curve, so we, we move around this curve by varying this feature map. This feature map might be a deep neural network and we, we change the map by changing the parameters of this deep neural network. Okay, and in this uh, coding assignment for this lecture, you will actually compute such a feature map yourself for the special case of requiring this feature map to be linear, a linear feature map. So in this case, you can, you can think of the linear map as a matrix. Let's call it F for feature map. So in the assignment, you have to find the matrix F. You have to find a matrix F such that when you apply it to the original features, it gives you new features. And these features should be maximally privacy preserving or 
you want to minimize the privacy leakage, minimum privacy leakage. In the sense that you should not be able to use these new features to build a, a predictor. So to feed in these new features into another map, let's call it uh, M, that is able to predict the, the private feature or the private attribute. So there should be no M such that you can accurately predict S, the private attribute. And how how can you construct such a, a feature map uh, such a feature map f? Well, you need to know something about the probability distribution. These are all then uh, probabil probabilistic statements. In particular, you want to ensure that this squared error or the mean squared error, the expectation of the squared error uh, of this new linear map that tries to predict the private feature is large. So this we want to have large. We do not want to find any M, any matrix that can recover or infer the, the private attribute from the new features. And uh, yeah, the, the key idea in the assignment is that this will be large as, uh, as long as the, as the cross correlation or covariance between the new features and the private attribute is zero. So those of you who, who took a course on estimation theory or uh, statistical methods, statistical inference, you might remember that the ability of a vector or the, the potential of a vector to allow to predict another variable in a linear fashion is characterized by the correlation. I mean, this is intuitively clear. If this is if this is a if there's a large correlation between C and S, then we should be able to, to predict S only from C by applying a map to C. If there's no correlation, then it might be hard to predict S from C. You can make this precise in uh, in different ways. Uh, you can also look up, for example, uh, minimum mean squared error estimation on Wikipedia. And there you will find you will find uh, closed form formulas for this error that you can achieve, and in these formulas you will see the covariance uh, vector here that I show you. Particularly if the covariance vector is zero, then this will be maximum. This is the this is the hardest case, so to say. And we want exactly we want this feature matrix F to result in new in new features C that are uh, that are that do not allow to predict S, the private property. I mean, that's the, the basic idea of privacy protection. Yes, and you will find then in the coding assignment description how to come up, how to find F that satisfies this zero correlation or zero covariance condition. Okay, it was quite a lot uh, about uh, technology for privacy protection in federated learning and more general in, in machine learning. So I hope this was a, an interesting introduction. If I remember, uh, you didn't, uh, most of you didn't hear about differential privacy. So of course I, I could only scratch the surface today, uh, but I'm, I'm happy to give you more detailed pointers to related courses and literature if you want to dig deeper uh, because anybody of you who, who needs to design a federated learning algorithm or works as a machine learning engineer, sooner or later you will uh, be facing questions like, can you guarantee privacy protection of your algorithm? So this might be really a, legal, a, rele a legally relevant question for your company or business. So uh, there's a good motivation to, to learn about how to ensure differential privacy and how to analyze differential privacy of federated learning methods. Okay. Any questions at this point? If not, then thanks for your attention and see you on Wednesday.